Hey, it's your YouTube dad back with a lot of film cameras. <laughs> there are a lot of people who ask me which camera should I start with if I want to get into film photography. So I kind of just wanted to lay out all of the film cameras we have in our studio at the moment uh, and just kind of talk about the differences between all of them from cheapest all the way to most expensive, 35 millimeter all the way to medium format. So let's just dive right in. First, we're gonna talk about the Olympus Stylus Zoom 140. This is a gift that was given to me by my buddy Ben Heisch, who I feel a lot like right now, to be perfectly honest, and less competent, to be honest. This is a point and shoot camera that is currently going for about 70 bucks, and it goes all the way from 38 mil all the way to 140. We looked online and it's, I think it's F4 at its widest for aperture. This is a really amazing point and shoot camera that I use for uh, daily life photographing my family. Uh, there is a little time code if you'd like to put that on there in the bottom right corner of images or you can turn it off if you'd like so you get kind of that retro vibe. Um, it's real, it's not just like an Instagram filter. But uh, yeah, this is a 35 millimeter film camera so it takes 35 millimeter film stock. It has an onboard flash, so if the scene is too dark, this will go off. Just like many other point and shoot cameras that have an auto setting for your exposure, they read the DX code on the film. So you could buy stickers to put over the DX code to trick it into thinking it's 200 speed film instead of 400 speed film. And that's how you can kind of overexpose your film, which is what a lot of people like to do in a camera like this. So it's kind of a way to hack the system. But other than that, it's a very easy, just throw it up to your face, point it at whatever and shoot away. So. You can turn the flash on and off as well, and I love it just for whenever we go out or go on vacation. Here are some photos that I have shot with this that I really like. Next up, we have Mike's Olympus XA. Uh, has a little clamshell in the front there that reveals a 35 millimeter fixed lens, f2.8. Uh, this is a really, really affordable, cheap rangefinder. They're currently going from anywhere from I don't know, around $125 to $175, I think, in that range. It's pretty plasticky. Uh, the build quality isn't like metal or anything, like you'll see later with the Leica, uh, but it is the same rangefinder style. So you have this little focus toggle down under the lens and uh, a rectangle in the middle of your viewfinder that helps you manually focus your scene and uh, what you want to get in focus that way. It is aperture priority, so you are stuck with whatever the camera chooses for shutter speed. So similarly, you can use a sticker over your DX code in this camera to trick it into thinking it is a lower speed film. And you can set your aperture over on the left here to whatever you would like. And this is also version one. There's also a version two that's a bit cheaper. Um, build quality is cheaper. This one's more expensive. It's the original version one that is a better build quality. This is a really cheap way to get a rangefinder camera, similar to if you know if you have the desire to get an M6 or something like that. This is a really good entry way to kind of get your um, your hands wet with trying something like a, a rangefinder, and it's really compact and small, so you can fit it in your pocket on the go. Here are some photos that Mike has taken with the XA that he really loves. Next up, we have the Canonet QL17. This is definitely not as popular. This is our buddy Gene's camera, another 35 millimeter rangefinder. And I believe this thing also goes for around $150. Similar to the XA and the Leica that I'll talk about eventually, it is a rangefinder, has that rectangle in the middle of the viewfinder. So when you focus with the focus lever, uh, you will see a ghost image through that rectangle going in and out of focus to be able to manually focus your image as well. Uh, there is an auto mode for aperture. When you're on that auto mode, that's virtually the only way you can get a meter within your viewfinder to expose your image. So with that, when you have it on the auto mode and you set your shutter on the lens, you will see that it'll tell you what aperture it's going to shoot the image at. So right now here it's saying it'll shoot it at f8. Otherwise, you can manually set your aperture if you'd like on the lens as well, along with your shutter. And uh, you could tell the camera what speed film you have in the camera. Instead of having to do the DX code thing, you could just tell the camera. We have Portrait 400 in the camera right now, but Gene has it set to read at 200 speed to try to trick the camera into overexposing it if he's on the auto mode. 
There is a fixed lens on this camera as well. It's a 40 millimeter f1.7, and it does not have an on-camera flash. This is definitely a slower speed um, camera. It's not necessarily a point and shoot. It takes a little bit more thought uh, to work with this, but some people just like that slower pace to be more intentional with their images. So here are some of Gene's favorite shots he's gotten with the little cannonette. Now we have Mike's Olympus Mu2. This is one of the most popular point and shoot cameras on the used market right now. It's not as expensive as something like a Contax T2 that like all the celebrities use or a Leica point and shoot. But this is currently going for around $300. It does have a 35 millimeter fixed F 2.8 lens and it's very, very comparable to the Olympus Stylus Zoom 140. It just doesn't zoom. It's just fixed 35 at F 2.8. So uh, you could get shallower depth of field and uh, another stop of light at its widest setting with the lens. Uh, and it also has a built-in flash right on camera. You can also do the date uh, stamp on there. So in the bottom right corner, you can get the date of the day you're shooting. And yeah, like I said, very, very similar to the Olympus Stylus Zoom, just more expensive. Here are some photos that Mike has taken with this camera that he loves. These next two are very, very comparable. They are the Canon One series uh, before they turned to digital with their SLRs. So these are 35 millimeter SLR cameras. <clears throat> the first one and the cheaper one is the One N. This is the one that Mike uh, owns. And it is an EF mount. So all of your Canon glass that you use for things like any crop sensor DSLR, um, like the 60D or any full frame DSLR that you use with Canon, like the 5D Mark III, Mark IV, you can use all those lenses on this camera, the EF mount. So if you have L series glass with Canon, you could use it on this camera, which is a huge reason why this is kind of separated from this first tier of camera, because you have such good glass that you can use with it. You know, dealing with film photography, if all of these have the same film stock in the back of the camera, you essentially have the same sensor. Uh, it's the same color um, you're working with and it's um, the same film speed and all that. So the glass is really important when it comes to film photography. So you get super shallow depth of field with prime lenses that you can put on here, like a 50 mil 1.2 or 35 1.4, or, or even the tilt shift that I love so much, the uh, F2.8 45 mil tilt shift that Canon has. A really amazing camera has autofocus as well. So those uh, Canon lenses will also work with autofocus on here. Uh, the only difference between this one and the next one, the 1V, is just a few other sweat settings with faster autofocus on uh, the predecessor, the 1V, and more focus points. And the 1V also has a setting where you could do multiple exposures on the same part of the film. So you could tell the camera not to advance the film after you've taken a photo, and you can shoot, I believe, up to 10 frames on the same section of film, which is kind of cool. I've only done a few times, but ultimately it doesn't really make sense to get the 1V if you don't care about those small little um, differences because the 1N currently goes for around $200, but the 1V goes for around $600. It's kind of insane to think about all of these cameras and how much they've appreciated over time because I bought the 1V for $300 about four years ago and it's double the price. And the next one I'm talking about, the M6, I bought for $1,450 in 2017. And it's now, uh, I have the more rare version, but it's now going for upwards of $3,500 on places like eBay. So I don't know what to think about film cameras right now. If it's like, you're still gonna ride the wave of them appreciating in value. Um, but the chances are they're probably just gonna keep appreciating in price, probably because of idiots like me making videos about them being cool. <laughs> Sorry. So last of the 35 mil film lineup, I have my Leica M6, my favorite camera, my favorite film camera of all time. And this is, not necessarily my everyday carry because I don't photograph things every day, but this is the thing I bring on trips. This is if I'm going out with the family and wanna shoot intentional photographs, this is what I use. I shoot it around the house. It is a very expensive camera, like I said, in the used market right now, but the functionality of and process of shooting with this camera 
is in my opinion second to none um, to really any other 35 mil film camera. It's so compact and tight and just sexy. And uh, I don't have like a glass on it. I have a Voigtlander 35 millimeter F 1.4. This is the SC version two. I originally had the Zeiss 35 millimeter Biogon F2. I just wanted that other full stop of aperture in a lens. And at 1.4, this definitely does vignette on the corners and gets pretty soft on the corners, but it's kind of dreamy and I kind of like it. Still sharp otherwise. And I really just don't have like a glass because I have a mortgage. So uh, this is the 0.85 viewfinder, which is a little bit tighter than the 0.72 viewfinder. You see in a lot of Leica M6s, this is the more rare version. The widest you can go with still having frame lines within that viewfinder is 35 millimeters with the 0.85 viewfinder. If you want something like 28 or 24, you would need to get the 0.72 viewfinder. But it's like butter shooting and advancing this thing. It's so quiet and um, yeah, I love it. You can also set your film speed in the back manually. So you don't have to do the DX code thing. You can trick it into believing it's a certain film stock and your meter in the viewfinder um, is pretty rock solid, so um, you don't have to carry around a light meter with it either. Here are some of my favorite shots with my Leica M6. All right, now we're jumping into the medium format gang. There are three cameras here, and the first one I'm talking about is one that I don't know very well because it's brand new to the family in our studio. This is Gene's new Pentax 645N. And uh, really this camera is one of the cheaper options in the 645 format. So it takes 120 film, which is different than the 35 mil film. Um, if you're unfamiliar with film photography, you've probably seen 35 millimeter film. It's the most popular. 120 film is nearly double the size, if not double the size, uh, but it has different form factors. So these last two have a different form factor than this one. Uh, it's really popular to use the 645 format for portraiture in portrait photography, wedding photography, if you choose to shoot film. It is six by 4.5 thus 645 is the format. There are other camera brands that have a 645 camera. One of the most popular is the Contact 645, as well as a Mamiya 645, and there's plenty of others. Pentax has another one. The 645N has autofocus, and Gene has the 75 millimeter f2.8. Uh, they do have a manual focus lens as well that is about half the price of this lens, but this total setup is around $1,000. Another really important thing that people like um, about this camera, as opposed to some of its competition in the other brands, is that it is really easy to hold with this grip on the side. It's pretty easy to just one hand and put by your side, uh, but it is a bit more plasticky feeling and light and almost hollow, uh, but it does have a nice eye cup on the viewfinder and the autofocus is pretty amazing. To load the film, you have a little block right here that you put the 120 film in over and attach to the other reel, as is the same in a lot of 120 film cameras. That just pops right back into there. But I don't believe you can have other backs with this. You're just kind of stuck with this, uh, as opposed to something like the Hasselblad that has interchangeable backs. Other than that, I think that's about it for this camera. So go ahead and check out uh, some of Gene's favorite shots with this camera. Ooh, this one. If you didn't see recently, I made a video about this camera. My buddy Ben gifted this to me, which is mind blowing. I think this full setup I looked up is around $1,600. So Ben's a good friend to have. <laughs> A lot of people recognize this camera as the camera that they took to the moon. Um, so that's pretty cool. This one isn't the actual one they took to the moon, but you get the idea. A lot of them have the square viewfinder on top that pops up and you can look down into it. But when you look down into that viewfinder, whenever you go left, things go right and vice versa. So it can get kind of confusing. But this one has the prism viewfinder that has an eye cup and you can just look in and everything is the same direction as the way you move, which is amazing. It's a full manual focus uh, system. So you just look through the viewfinder to focus and it's pretty dang clear. Uh, this, is an, this is an old camera that hasn't been serviced in a long time. So it's pretty dirty and not super easy to see perfectly clear, but everything I've shot through it has been pretty rock solid focus wise. Uh, I have the newer version of the Zeiss 80 mil f2.8 for this system. And like in the name, it says uh, opens up to f2.8 and has a max shutter of one over 500. Um, and then 
Chris Chu talked about this in his video about the 500CM. It, it, it seems as if they built this camera to have your left hand kind of placed in this little pocket right here. And they said your right hand should be the one focusing. But to me, that feels really awkward. I actually just like grabbing it with my right hand in the back and my left hand kind of rocking back and forth for focus on the lens. Um, it makes a really wonderful sound when you take a photo. And I have a advancing knob that works like that. Some people have a lever where you pull. After you load the film, you crank this to get it to frame number one. And at the end of the roll, you also roll this to crank it to the end of the roll. Also, the Hasselblad is a six by six format, which is a square. Um, so all your photos are a square, not like the 645, um, that's six by 4.5, but six by six. That's about all I have on this camera. Here are some of my favorite pre preliminary photos that I've taken on it. Finally, we have Mike's prized possession, the Mamiya 6 MF. There is a Mamiya 6 without the MF and a Mamiya 7. The Mamiya 7 is a 6x7 format, but this is also a 6x6, very similarly, but the same as uh, the Hasselblad 500CM. The MF stands for multi-format, which I'll get into in a bit. There are only three lenses that you could put on this camera and they are collapsible into the camera. So they extend when you want to shoot and they collapse when you want to break it down and throw it in a bag or put it on your hip or just be to be more compact. This is, I think, undoubtedly the most compact six by six system on the market um, because of that collapsibility and just the small form factor. It's very shallow, not super deep. Um, I mean, very different. <laughs> this is also a rangefinder style viewfinder, similar to the M6 and the XA and the Canonet. So you have a square in the middle of this viewfinder that you manually focus. Um, so some people really prefer focusing that way instead of autofocusing or just kind of guessing focus through your prism viewfinder. This lens in particular is the 50 mil. They also have a 75 mil, I believe, 70 or 75 and a 140 or 150. I can't remember what the exact dimensions are. But this is the widest one they offer and it only opens up to F4. Um, the 70 or 75 mil, I can't remember which, uh, is an F3.5. And so that's kind of geared more towards portraiture. And this one's geared a little bit more towards landscape. Mike wanted to go this route um, because he figured he would take more landscapes with this camera. It's amazing, it works very, very similarly to the M6. A lot of people say it's the medium format version of a Leica or a Leica M6, and I have to agree, it's a very, very solid build. It's not hollow feeling like the 645N is. It feels very metally and hard and compact and has a lot of weight to it. Uh, max shutter of one over 500, and it's a beaut. Check out some of the photos we took with this camera over the past year. That was a lot of information. These are a lot of cameras. Hope uh, just informational in some capacity. Uh, a lot of times I don't know what the heck I'm talking about, uh, but I'm feeling more and more confident about film photography these days, especially since we have been processing all of our film in studio and scanning it ourselves, which is really cool. So I'll be making more videos about that soon. I'm gonna be partnering with a company called Negative Supply, uh, which is a company we use to process and scan a lot of what we do uh, with film photography. So. If you're interested in that, uh, make sure to like and do all the things, subscribe and bell and yeah. Uh, if you're interested in this stuff and anything else I do that you see on my channel and uh, I hope you're having a great day. I will see you soon, bye.